We've asked our question, we've done the search, and have found information. Step three in the evidence-based practice process is to appraise what you've selected. I'm going to just touch upon the appraisal step this week. We're going to revisit this in more depth later on in the semester. The appraisal process seems to cause both students and practitioners a lot of stress, mainly because some of you aren't yet an expert in either your field or in research methodology. But there are some techniques that can make this process a little easier. Let's start at level one, as basic as it gets. Is the source you're looking at scholarly or not? When it comes to evidence-based information, you really want to focus on scholarly sources. You can find some interesting information in popular sources, but you're not going to be making practice changes based on what you find in Newsweek. If it has references, technical language, and not likely to be found at Barnes & Noble, then it's probably a scholarly source. The next question to ask of your source is, is this peer-reviewed? Most of you are probably familiar with this term. It's pretty common in scholarly journals, and it's the first gate of sorts to ensure that only high-quality research is being accepted and published. It's definitely not perfect. Some great research never gets published, and less than great or even outright fraud or fabrication makes it into prestigious journals. And for those who've been through the publishing process, it may feel like this cartoon is way too true, but it's not actually how it's done. Basically, you submit a paper to a journal. They then distribute it to anywhere from two to five peer reviewers. That's others in your field who can evaluate the article based on their expertise. These reviewers then make suggestions, comments, nasty jibes. Okay, only sometimes on that last one. And then send it back to you. You make changes, and if it passes muster, it gets published. Yay! So, how can you tell if the article you're looking at is peer-reviewed? Some databases, like the nursing-focused one CINAHL, allow you to search specifically for just peer-reviewed journals. Just one click of a button, and that's all it takes. The ISU library also has access to a database called Ulrichs. It's just a ton of information about individual journals. So boring, unless you want to know if that journal's peer-reviewed. Just go to the database, type in the name of the journal, and look for the little referee uniform. An alternate term for peer review is refereed, so if you see the uniform, it means the journal is peer reviewed. Now, let's step it up a bit. Figuring out the quality of health or medical or nursing research articles is such a big deal that there's a whole strategy that's been developed to make it quick and relatively painless. It's called rapid critical appraisal. And most versions of this have you look at just three aspects of each paper to determine how well the study was done. You want to find the level of evidence, determine how well the study was done, and how useful this research is to your patients or situation. It's not too scary, right? Of course, that's not all there is to appraising an article, but it's where we're going to start. The first step in rapid critical appraisal is to determine the level of evidence. The higher it is on the pyramid, the more comfortable you should be with it being a high quality source of information. So how do you find the level of evidence for articles again? Most of the time, it's right there in the title. Other times, you'll find it in the abstract or the method section of the article. The first step of rapid critical appraisal is really pretty easy. The second step is to determine how well the study is conducted. This makes most of us very nervous because we're not professional researchers and probably not experts in statistics. I know that I'm not. So how can us civilians judge how well a study's been done? The key is to look for some important numbers within the research article. First, look for the sample size, generally referred to as the N. A bigger number is almost always better. Popular news sources frequently report on studies with headlines like coffee will make you live longer or caffeine intake increases the risk for whatever. I like to track down the original studies from these news stories and I almost always find that the sample size is small, generally less than 200. There's no way I'm making caffeine related health decisions based on a small sample size. The next number to look for is the duration of follow-up. This is when the researchers checked back in with the participants. It can be as little as a few hours to as long as decades. In the coffee example, I would hope that the follow-up was at least a few years. It truly should have been decades to honestly determine if coffee has an impact on life expectancy. But in some studies, a shorter follow-up is completely appropriate if the research is short-term in nature. Mainly, the follow-up needs to match the study question. 
And finally, look for the completeness of follow-up. This has to do with patient withdrawal or removal from the study. If the research loses a lot of people from the study, either they drop out or stop participating or die, that needs to be taken into consideration. There are statistics to control for some loss of participants, but too many dropouts will weaken the study. A lot of times, the three numbers you're looking for will be right there in the abstract. Other times, you'll need to read through the paper itself to find what you need. In this case, we find the number of participants and the follow-up information in the abstract. But there's nothing about how many participants actually completed the study. You'll almost always have to jump into the results section to find this. In this case, only 73% of the treatment group finished the study, and only 68% of the comparison group completed it. Generally, if you lose more than 20%, it starts to get a little shaky. So, this is a red flag. Though not too surprising in a smoking cessation study, these tend to have higher dropout rates to begin with. Look in the discussion section to see if the author addresses the dropout and how, or if, they compensated for it. Sometimes they'll even have a pretty flowchart that will show you the initial N and how many made it to the end of the study. I'm a very visual person, so I love these. Okay, it's your turn. I want you to read over the abstract and the results section to find the answers. Remember to look for the number of participants, the follow-up time, and the dropout rate. Pause the presentation and restart when you're ready to see what I found. First, what was the sample size? This is found in the abstract and in the results section of the paper. Just 11, so it was a pretty small study. What was the follow-up time? From what I can tell, it was 14 days. Looks like the study went over about a total of 28 days. Finally, the dropout rate? This article listed it within the body of the paper, in the results section. Very good! Now that's not too hard, right? The third step in rapid critical appraisal is to determine if the study results are useful to you, your situation, and or your patients. This is one step that some novice researchers lose sight of. You get really excited that you found a well-done systematic review on your topic, but you might not take the time to compare the research participants to yours, or the healthcare setting, or the work culture. These can all have an impact on your success rate of actually implementing the change. Mainly, you want to know how closely the participants in the research study match your patients. You can find this data in the article itself, usually in Table 1. This tends to be the participant profile, at least in quantitative studies. This is the table from the smoking cessation study. We have slightly more men than women. The average age is 44. They're mostly white. They've been smoking for about 27 years, and they smoke about 20 cigarettes a day. If you're looking at starting Varenicline for your patients to help them quit, you want to know if any of these characteristics will make a difference. What if your patients are much older? What if they smoke more or less? What if they're a different ethnicity? Sometimes you won't know if these differences will impact implementing change in your situation, but you at least need to be aware of the possibility. Digging a little deeper, you can ask even more questions. The article at the bottom of the slide is one in a 12 article series on evidence-based nursing. Yes, 12. And out of the 12 articles, three focus on critical appraisal. That's a sign of how complex this process can be. Reading through this series isn't required, but it really is good information. Don't forget to use appraisal checklists. These will help you move beyond just the basic rapid critical appraisal. We talked about these earlier in the semester, and they are super helpful for us novice researchers. Keep using these as you work through the research you find. The CASP website has checklists for all the major types of studies, from meta-analyses to case control studies. Of course there's more. This has been a librarian's take on critical appraisal, so it's definitely not the entire story. Having even a rudimentary grasp of statistics is really valuable when it comes to appraising the literature. No, you don't need to be a biostatistician, but it is good to know what some of these terms mean, and even how to calculate them yourself from the data listed in the article. We'll come back to this fun stuff in week 14. We are just sort of dipping our toe into the third step of evidence-based practice by looking at just rapid critical appraisal of primarily journal articles. So, you're just trying to answer those three questions when you read a research study. 
what's the level of evidence, how well was the study done, and how useful is this information to your patients or situation. These answers are almost found in the abstract, methods section, or the results section. Now, that's not as bad as you thought it was going to be, right?